Hi everyone, here we are again for Ways of the World, a brief global history with sources. As we continue our study of the Atlantic Revolution's global echoes, we will now today compare the Atlantic Revolution. So let's start with the North American Revolution, 1775 to 1787. Now there are some basic facts of the American Revolution that are well known, but the bigger question is what the American Revolution changed. The American Revolution was a conservative political movement. It aimed to preserve colonial liberties rather than gain new ones. And for most of the 17th and 18th centuries, the British North American colonies had a lot of local autonomy. Colonists regarded that autonomy as their birthright, and few thought of actually breaking away from Britain before 1750. There are differences between England and its North American colonies. The colonial society was far more egalitarian than European society. And in manners, British colonists were Republican well before the Revolution. But Britain made a new drive to control the colonies to get more revenue from them in the 1760s. Britain needed money for its global war with France. New taxes and tariffs were imposed on the colonies. The colonists were not represented in British Parliament. Now, Britain appeared to deny the colonists' identity as true Englishmen. Colonial economic interests were challenged and Britain eventually attacked established colonial or colonist tradition of that local autonomy that they uh, felt so strongly for and was their birthright. The British North America was revolutionary for the society that had already emerged, not for the revolution itself. No significant social transformation came with independence from Britain. The revolution accelerated democratic tendencies that were already established. And the political power really remained in the hands of the existing elites. And many Americans thought they were creating a new world order. Some claimed the United States as, quote-unquote, the end and model of the human race. And the declaration of the, quote-unquote, right to revolution inspired other colonies around the world. And the U.S. Constitution was one of the first lasting efforts to put Enlightenment political ideals into place. So let's look at this map, the United States after the American Revolution. The union of the 13 British colonies in North America created the embryonic United States shown here in 1788. Over the past two centuries and more of anti-colonial struggles, it was the only example of separate colonies joining together after independence to form a larger and enduring nation. So how did the organization of the colonies affect the later establishment of the United States? Well, the original United States largely followed the boundaries established during the British colonial period, with the exception of the Trans-Appalachian region, there, some of the original colonies had claimed territories west of the Appalachian Mountains that ultimately became separate states, which you can see uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, and west of uh, what we know of as Georgia. All right, patriots and loyalists. So this English engraving dating from 1775 depicts a club-wielding mob of, quote, liberty men, forcing a Virginian loyalist, someone committed to continued British rule, to sign a document probably endorsing independence for the colonies. And the threat of violence toward the loyalist is apparent in the armed crowd, the barrel of tar being used as a table for the, in the foreground, and the sack of feathers hanging from the gallows in the background. Patriots frequently tarred and feathered recalcitrant loyalists during the lead-up to the American Revolution. So based on the image, how were the American patriots viewed in England? This image demonstrates that some English viewed the American patriots as an unruly mob that accomplished its ends through violence. All right, let's look at the French Revolution, 1789 to 1815. Thousands of French soldiers had fought for the American revolutionaries, but the French government was facing bankruptcy. The government had long attempted to modernize the tax system and make it more fair, but was opposed by the privileged classes. And King Louis XVI called the Estates General into session in a new effort to raise taxes. But when the Estates General convened in 1789, the third estate representatives uh, broke loose and declared themselves the National Assembly. And the third estate is made up of commoners. They drew on the declar or, excuse me, they drew up the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, and these actions then launched the French Revolution. Now, unlike the American Revolution, the French uprising was driven by pronounced social conflicts. The titled nobility resisted monarchic efforts to tax them. The middle class then resented the aristocratic and nobility, um, the privileges of the nobility. And the urban poor suffered from inflation and unemployment, and the peasants were severely oppressed. 
the execution of Robespierre. So the beheading on the guillotine, which is this machine right here. Um, the beheading of radical leader Robespierre, who had himself brought thousands of others to the guillotine, marked a decisive turning point in the unfolding of the French Revolution and the end of its most violent phase. So what caused the French Revolution to be more violent or more radical than the American Revolution? Violent's not the right word. Radical. Well, internal resistance and foreign opposition produced the fear that the French Revolution might be overturned. And so to counter that possibility, urban crowds organized insurrections that led to much more radicalism than the American Revolution, where the status quo prevailed. All right, the French Revolution continued. Now, these Enlightenment ideas gave people a language to articulate their grievances. Now, the French Revolution was violent, far-reaching, and radical. Um, it ended hereditary privilege, also abol abolished slavery for a time. The church was sub uh, subjected to government authority. The king and queen were executed in 1793. And the reign of terror from 1793 to 1794 is when uh, tens of thousands of people were killed uh, as they were regarded as enemies of the revolution. And there were efforts to create a whole new society. 1792 became year one of a new calendar. The country briefly passed a law for universal male suffrage. France was divided into 83 territorial departments. A massive army, approximately 800,000 men, were created to fight threatening neighbors. In terms of gender roles, however, the French Revolution did not create a new society. Women didn't, did participate in the revolution, but efforts to gain political rights ultimately failed. And there are feelings of nationalism that increased with the revolutionary state at the center. The radicals especially pushed these ideas of the new beginnings. Now, the French Revolution influences spread through conquest. Napoleon Bonaparte, who ruled from 1789 to 1814, seized power. And he preserved many moderate elements of the revolution. He kept social equality but got rid of liberty. His forces subdued most of Europe. And he imposed revolutionary practices on all of his conquered regions. And there's a resentment of French domination that developed, and that stimulated national consciousness throughout Europe. There we go. All right. Uh, let's look at this map here, Napoleon's European Empire. So the French Revolution spawned a French empire under Napoleon's leadership that encompassed most of Europe and served to spread the principles of the revolution. Now, based on the evidence in the map, how did the rise of Napoleon facilitate the spread of enlightenment across the European continent? Well, as the map demonstrates, Napoleon's military expansion from Spain to Russia created the largest European empire since the Romans. Along with his soldiers and guns, he brought Enlightenment ideas to most of Europe. And in this respect, one might compare the cultural diffusion facilitated by Napoleon's conquest to the process of Hellenization under Alexander the Great. Remember, under the conquest of Alexander the Great, um, once the Greek, Persian, Egyptian and Indian culture merged, a whole new culture uh, developed with mi as a mixture and a blending of all of those, and that was the Hellene culture, or um, under Alexander the Great, uh, the Hellenistic culture. All right, let's look at the Haitian Revolution, 1791-1804. Now, St. Domingue, later called Haiti, was a French Caribbean colony, and it was regarded as the richest colony in the world. But a vast majority of the population was slaves. Now, the example of the French Revolution sparked a viral, viral, excuse me, sparked a spiral of violence. The revolution meant different things to different people. And so a massive slave revolt began in 1791. And the revolution became a war between a number of factions. Power gradually shifted to the slaves, who were led by former slave Toussaint Louverture. The result was a unique revolution the only completely successful slave revolt in world history. The country was renamed Haiti, which means mountainous in Taino, the native language. So the Haitians identified themselves with the original native inhabitants. They declared equality for all races. And the former plantations were then divided among small farmers. Now the destructiveness of, of the revolution, internal divisions, and external opposition led to the poverty and unstable politics amongst the people. And the, quote, independence debt that France forced upon Haiti was a major problem. Now, Haiti's success generated great hope and great fear. 
created a new, quote, insolence among slaves elsewhere and inspired other slave rebellions, it caused horror among uh, elites that led to social conservatism, but it increased slavery elsewhere as the plantations that were in Haiti uh, were now part of the market, and Haiti's plantations were no longer part of the market. And Napoleon's defeat in Haiti convinced him to then sell Louisiana territory to the United States in 1803. All right, this early 19th century engraving entitled Revenge Taken by the Black Army shows black Haitian soldiers uh, hanging a large number of French soldiers, thus illustrating both the violence and the radical, or excuse me, racial dimension of the upheaval in Haiti. The only fully successful slave rebellion uh, in this uprising of the French Caribbean, Caribbean colony, first called Saint Domingue, later called Haiti, uh, sparked was sparked by the French Revolution, and it led to the establishment of an independent state after a long and bloody war. So, in what ways were the French and Haitian revolutions similar in their use of terror? What accounts for the relative levels of violence in each? Well, both revolutions sought to overturn the existing social order with the commoners in France and the slaves in Haiti seeking to win political freedom and power from the entrenched elites of their respective societies, be the nobility in France or plantation owners in Haiti. And the use of terror was similar in that they were a product of sharp internal divisions, whether it was based on race or class or both, but were also fueled by fear of external threats. In both instances, the ruling elites also had the power of the state or force on their side, and were not willing to sacrifice their property and their lives without first employing it. Thus, the French and Haitian revolutions were incredibly violent. All right, Spanish-American revolutions, 1808 to 1825. So Latin American revolutions were inspired by earlier revolutionary movements. Native-born elites, Creoles, and Spanish colonies in Latin America were offended at the Spanish monarchy's effort to control them in the 18th century. And Latin American independence movements were limited at first. There's little tradition of local self-government. That autonomy just wasn't the same in South America as it had been in the British colonies of North America. Society was more authoritarian with stricter class divisions. And um, they were the, the Europeans were vastly outnumbered, were those of European descent. The Creole elites had revolution thrust upon them by the events in Europe. In 1808, Napoleon invaded Spain and Portugal, and that put the royal authority in disarray. Latin Americans were forced to take action, and most of Latin America was independent then by 1826. So let's look at the map of Latin American independence. And with the exception of Haiti, Latin American revolutionary, revolutions brought independence to new states, but offered very little social change or political opportunity for the vast majority of people. So which regions remained colonies after 1830. Well, after 1830, three European colonies in South America, British Guiana, Dutch Suriname, and French Guiana, two European colonies in the Caribbean, Cuba and Puerto Rico, and one colony in Central America, British Honduras, remained. So if you were to look at the map in chapter 17, it's uh, Latin America and the world. If you were to look at the ma that map and see the differences in border, you could cha uh, identify changes in borders, political borders, um, here in Latin America. But not all of the borders changed. Some of the political boundaries remained stable. Um, but do the alterations to borders indicate significant political change? Well, like I said, the boundaries have remained fairly stable, though Mexico and Bolivia have lost territory, which you can see that as well into the United States. And... All of this is known, not all Bolivia. <clears throat> um, now, the forming and uh, Mexico lost that land to the United States. Ch uh, Bolivia lost that land to Chile and Brazil. And moreover, you see the United Provinces of Central America broke up. There we go. Okay. Uh, Spanish American revolutions continued. Now, gaining independence took longer than in North America. Latin American societies were torn by class, race, and regional divisions. There's fear of social rebellion from below that shaped the whole independence movement. The leaders of independence movements appealed to the lower classes in terms of nativism, 
all free people born in the Americas were Americanos. But many um, of those that have, of European descent and mestizos regarded themselves as Spanish. But many leaders were liberals. Influenced by the ideas of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. So in rea reality, lower classes, Native Americans, and slaves got very little benefit from independence. Women gained little from the independent struggle, and it proved impossible to unite the various Spanish colonies, unlike the United States. Distances were greater, colonial experiences were different, and there are stronger regional identities that existed within these different uh, regions in South America. After Latin America gained independence, its traditional relationship with North America was gradually reversed. The United States grew wealthier, industrialized, more democratic, internationally influential, and stable. Latin American countries, however, became increasingly underdeveloped, impoverished, undemocratic, politically unstable, and dependent on foreign technology and investment. All right, Simón Bolívar. Among the heroic figures of Spanish-American independence movements, none was more significant than Simón Bolívar, shown here in a moment of triumph entering his hometown of Caracas in present-day Venezuela. But Bolívar was immensely disappointed in the outcomes of independence. His history was a unified South America that perished amid the rivalries of separate countries. So what indicators of Latin American social status are shown in the image above? The image of Bolivar parading through Caracas shows Native Americans and Mestizos cheering for him from the street, while the wealthier uh, laud him from their balconies, providing a visual representation of social status and racial hierarchies in Latin America. And that concludes our study of comparing the Atlantic revolutions. I will see you guys for Echoes of Revolution.